Oh, please work, please work, please work, please work, please work. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. This is part two of the Kozo Pennsylvania A3 Switcher locomotive build. I'm going to get a real start on the boiler today. We're going to do some heating and beating on copper and make some cool parts. So let's go. Indulge me here for a moment while I explain the basics of a coal-fired locomotive boiler. Because if you don't understand the structure here, then all the parts that I'm going to be making here aren't going to make any sense. So fundamentally, a locomotive boiler is just a cylinder with a big block attached to the back of it. Now this is obviously extremely crudely simplified, but it'll give you the idea here. So of course the barrel at the front there is where all the water and the steam are. The bottom of it is water, and the top half is where the steam is sitting, ready to be fed out into the cylinders. And then the back here is the firebox, and this is essentially a double-walled box with the coal fire sitting in the middle of it and water all the way around it. And it's surrounded by water both for safety because it buffers the heat of the coal fire, which can be white hot and extremely intense, and of course it's also for efficiency because it captures as much of the heat of the coal fire as possible. And then the bottom there is open so that you can dump the ashes out. Then you can see the tubes there are open to the fire, and those are variously called the fire tubes or the smoke tubes. And the combustion products of the fire go out through those tubes, travel down the length of the inside of the barrel, transferring some of their heat out into the water, and then sending the combustion gases out the smoke box and up the chimney at the other end. 90% of the steam is actually created here on what's called the crown sheet. That's the area right above the coal fire. But the smoke tubes do create some steam as well. This is obviously a very complex structure, and the way that you build them is by creating a series of sheet metal parts that are rolled into various forms and then silver soldered together in a giant jigsaw puzzle. So that's the road that we're starting on today. I'm going to start with the front tube sheet, which sits here at the front and seals off the end of the barrel and exposes the tubes into the smoke box. This is a simple disc shape with a flange around the edge. All of these parts are made with a hardwood former. I'm using oak here. And you start by machining the former into the exact shape that you want the sheet metal to take and then hammer it into shape. Now I couldn't find my compass, so I'm using a divider here to just scribe a line on the wood there. You can't see it on camera, but I can see it in person. I'm going to start by roughing this in on the bandsaw here just to remove the bulk of the material there. I'm going to need to finish this on the lathe though because even though these are made of wood, the dimensions here are actually quite critical because of course the sheet metal will take on the form of the former quite exactly and then these sheet metal parts have to fit together extremely precisely when we're done. So precision really matters here on these hardwood forms. I'm going to drill a hole down the center here and this is going to go on a mandrel in the lathe so I can turn this to a very accurate diameter. I'm going to start by drilling this slightly undersized and then reaming it to a very close fit on my mandrel. I wasn't actually sure if reaming wood works. I'm not a woodworker, as I'm sure is already painfully obvious, but uh, actually that worked really well. So I don't know, do, do woodworkers use reamers? If not, you should, because they worked great. Over to the lathe now. I've got a piece of scrap steel here. I'm going to face off the end here. I'm using very light cuts because I've got a lot of stick out there, but that's okay. I can get away with it, and it saves me setting up the steady rest or other such shenanigans. With that faced now, I can get my center in there. I'm going to need tail support here because I've got a lot of stick out. Normally when you make a mandrel, it's usually for like a one-off turning situation, and so you just use a short piece of steel that sits close to the chuck, and you turn it down, which gives you concentricity on that mandrel, and then without touching it in the chuck, you put the part on, you turn down your part, and you're done. However, I had in mind that this mandrel is going to get used multiple times, so I wanted something that I can take in and out of the lathe multiple times and not lose my concentricity. So that's why I'm turning it down long, as you see here. I've got a long, large diameter section there that's going to go in my collet chuck, and then I turn down the small section here at the end, which is actually going to hold the part. I've got a section at the base there turned to exactly one quarter. That's my registration diameter. And then I turn down the outer part of that a little bit more to give clearance for the threading die, and I cut a thread on the end there. You always need a shoulder on a mandrel because the nut has to have something to clamp the part against. You can't clamp the part against a chuck or other work holding tool because then the nut will just pull the mandrel out of the jaws. I'll do a test fit here with the blank before I take this part down off the lathe. 
And that looks like that's going to work really well. So you can see how I'll be able to put a washer on there and tighten down a nut. And that's going to give me an excellent turning fixture for this wood. All right, now I can part this mandrel off. Again, you wouldn't do this if this was a one-time use mandrel, as most mandrels are, but I had it in my head that I was going to use this multiple times. And I keep saying it that way because it turns out I did only need this once, and so this was kind of a waste of time. But anyway, here we are. I made a nice little mandrel that can be taken out and put back into a collet chuck without losing concentricity. After snugging that up, I'll put the eye test indicator on it. And that looks to be running with zero run out, so very, very good. I'm not going to put an actual dial test indicator on it because that's only going to tell me something I don't want to know. All right, on to the mandrel now with the wooden blank, and I can turn this down. This is literally the first time I've ever turned wood on a wood or metal lathe, so I really had no idea how this was going to go. For RPM, I chose balls out on the rationale that woodworking tools all run insanely fast, so wood seems to like speed, and I chose a very sharp high rake insert also on the rationale that that seems to be what woodworking tools all have on them. You can see I've also got a shop vac set up close to the tool there. I'm trying to minimize the amount of sawdust and wood chips that get on the machine. Sawdust and wood chips are not good for machine tools. They get caught in slides and they absorb oil and in the case of oak they can even be mildly acidic so it's definitely not something you want on the machine any more than necessary. It's not quite as bad as grinding dust but it's definitely not great so I'm doing my best here to keep it to a minimum and uh, actually that shop vac worked really well. It basically caught all of the dust and probably about half of the chips. I'm turning this down carefully to the dimensions specified in the book here. Kozo supplies the dimensions for all of these formers of course and also the dimensions for the copper sheet that goes on them. I'm breaking the sharp corners there with a woodworker's deburring tool. It's like a sheet of dead tree with tiny rocks glued to it. I don't know, woodworking tools are very strange, but this is what I was told to use, and it does seem to work well on this material. That's it for that part. That's the backer plate. Each part has a backer and a former, so the backer is a simpler geometry. Then I did the same thing again to make the former. The former is generally a little smaller, or sometimes the same size, and it has a radius on the business edge. So that's what I'm doing here is I'm putting a 1 16th inch radius on that edge. And that's going to give the copper a nice radius bend when we hammer form it. This was easy to do with just a file and some sandpaper working to the radius gauge. Now the good stuff though, it's time for copper. So this is a very large chunk that I got from McMaster as you saw in the previous video in this series. I'm going to scribe and rough cut a chunk there because this big piece of copper is too big to work with all at once. I'm going to change out the blade on my bandsaw here for a fine pitch one because this is thin material. This is a big, what DeWalt calls their 1014 TPI blade. I don't know if it's 10 or 14 TPI or both or they're not sure. I don't know why they call it that. But I swapped in a 24 TPI blade which is good for sheet metal. I don't know if this copper qualifies as sheet metal exactly. It's 80 thou thick which is really quite thick. So it's somewhere between sheet metal and plate I would say. But this 24 TPI blade did a beautiful job on it, so this was definitely the right choice. Unfortunately, the piece is too wide in one dimension right now to fit in my bandsaw, so I had to finish this cut with the jigsaw. But this gave me an opportunity to show you that you don't have to have a bandsaw to do this. If you're going to do one of these boilers, you can use a jigsaw for most of the rough cutting. Just get those little metal cutting blades that they have for them. It's not a lot of fun with the jigsaw, but in a pinch it does work. And once again, I lay out my circle. I'm putting a very light punch in the center. I don't want to damage the copper because this is a pressure vessel after all. So I'm putting in just enough of a punch that will hold the point on the divider there. And that little hint of a punch is going to serve us well later for hammer forming as well. Then much like with the wood, I start by rough cutting out this circle on the bandsaw. Interestingly, the dimensions of the copper are much more approximate. Because we are going to be hammer forming it, it's going to be a fairly rough piece when we're done anyway. So the size of the copper that is given to you by the drawings is basically like a little oversize. So it's sufficient here to just cut to my layout lines and that's going to be close enough. We don't have to machine to a super accurate dimension here because we're going to be hammering this over the former in any case. And then the final copper part gets machined down to final dimension. So I rough cut on the bandsaw as close to my layout lines as I dared and then I file down to my layout line. If you're new to metalworking, the secret to filing a good curve is to drop the handle of the file on each stroke. You want the file to describe the opposite curve from the one you're creating. 
This is unintuitive and you frequently see people try to do it the other way where they try to move the file around the corner on each stroke. If you do that though, you just end up creating flat spots. So drop the handle of the file on each stroke and you'll be amazed how easy it is to create terrific curves. A quick check here on my dimensions and things are looking good. So I'm ready to hammer form, but before I can do that, I have to anneal it. When you buy copper like this, it comes in a state that's called half hard, which is basically hard and you can't hammer form hard copper. You have to make it soft by annealing it. To anneal copper, you heat it up until it's kind of a dull red or a reddish orange glowing kind of color and then let it cool down naturally. I'm using a Sievert propane torch here. You can use map gas, you could use acetylene or oxypropane if you want, but they absolutely are not necessary. Any old regular propane torch is fine. The larger the nozzle on the torch, the faster this will go. And you really want a hearth for this as well because it helps contain the heat and the bricks will heat up and make subsequent annealings go quicker. Here's what the part will look like when it's hit the right temperature. This is actually a different part. I filmed this multiple times trying to get a good shot of it for you. It's very difficult to film this such that it looks to you on film the way it does in person, but you can kind of see here with the lights low that it's a dull glowing reddish orange. When you get to that, shut the torch off and let it cool down. I strongly recommend turning the lights down when you're doing this because it's much easier to see when the copper is at the right temperature. The glowing is not very bright, so if your shop lights are on, you won't be able to see it and you'll end up overheating the copper. Once it's cool to the touch, I can align it with the hammer forms. The former plate with the radius on it goes up against the copper and I used a transfer punch to line up the center hole with the very light punch mark that you may recall is on that copper. And then I just start hammering it over the radius. The backer plate is just there to keep the back of the plate straight right behind the radius that we're creating. Otherwise the copper will bow out there as we bend it over. And I did figure out later it's a lot easier to hammer this the other way. The ergonomics are a lot better, but you can see me working my way around here. The secret to this is don't try to do too much at once. You just want to start tipping that edge over a little bit and work your way around. And you'll feel that the copper work hardens at a certain point and hammering isn't having any effect anymore. And then it's time to go anneal it again and then put it back in the form and do some more hammering. With a really good annealing, I found you can get about two laps around the part before you have to anneal it again. And I was doing, I would say, three to five annealings for each of these parts. Also note that I'm using a plastic faced hammer here, that's important. Any kind of metal hammer will ding up the surface of the copper and you may or may not be able to machine that out when you're done. And you don't need a big, heavy, strong hammer for this. The copper is so soft after a good annealing that you can see what a small hammer I'm using and with the plastic face on it, it has no trouble at all tipping that edge over. This process is actually really satisfying and really quite easy as long as you have a really good anneal on there. It's all about the annealing. Once the copper is tight against the former all the way around, I pull it off and that's looking really good. I'll take some measurements here to make sure I'm kind of in the ballpark. Kozo helpfully also gives you dimensions of what the hammer formed part should be before machining. This is important. This part has to be larger than the final machined dimension because again, the surface does have to be machined down to be perfect for the final boiler assembly. I'm also checking for square here, make sure my flange is 90 degrees and that looks really good. Well, that was the easiest one. On to the firebox formers now, which are a little trickier. I decided that divider thing wasn't working very well. I needed a proper compass and I couldn't find mine. So I created a field expedient one from a spare set of dividers. Once again, I'm laying out the part on the wood and then I rough cut it out on the bandsaw. And again, I'm putting a hole at the center of the radius there. And I've also added a second hole to help me clamp it to the rotary table because from now on, all these formers are going to be made on the rotary table. I have a great tool for this job. This is the rotary table end rounding fixture that I made a while back. There's a video on this if you're interested. It consists of a mandrel that goes in the Morse taper center of my rotary table there. And then there's a series of centering and fixturing pins that I can put in there for various jobs. So in this case, I'm using one of the larger pins to center up the rotary table to start with. I gotta get the spindle zeroed on the center of the table and it has to remain there for all the other operations that we're gonna do here. And then I can put in a pin sized for the reference hole in the hardwood former there. And that's gonna get the center of my radius on the former centered on the rotary table and also of course centered on the spindle. Those fixturing pins have a shoulder on them that's the same thickness as my parallels. So I can slide these under here and that will keep the part up off the rotary table so I can machine the side of it without the end mill touching the table. Now I need to get the center line of the former aligned with the zero on the table there. I did that with a pair of 
parallels like you see here using the t-slot as a reference. This is a very clunky and not very accurate way to do it, and I did come up with a better way later, so stay tuned, but it got me close enough for this part. This doesn't have to be perfect because we're going to be cutting all sides of the part, so as long as the cutter is fully engaged in the wood all the way around, it doesn't matter a whole lot where you started. And then I move the y-axis of the table to the radius that I want for that top part of the form there, and I can plunge the cutter down and start making my cut by rotating the table. I'm using a two flute cutter here, again on the rationale that, again, woodworking tools always have a very small number of flutes and a very low flute density on them, so I figured a two flute cutter would work, and it did seem to work really well. And once again, I'm running the mill wide open here because wood seems to like speed. This is a very easy cut here, just 90 degrees on the rotary table. And because of how simple this shape is, once I get to the 90 degree point, I can then just feed down on the x-axis and cut this adjacent side at the same time. You can see that I did have to rearrange my parallels mid-cut there. I did get a better parallel configuration figured out here later. I get better and better at making these as we go along, but I'm fumbling a little bit here at the start. In hindsight, I probably should have just machined a little temporary spacer that's smaller than the part, and then I could have just cut all sides in one setup much easier than messing with the parallels like this. That gives me half the part, and then I add a clamp to the part, and then remove the other clamp, so there's always two clamps holding the part at all times. That way nothing moves while I play musical clamps here. And I can get back onto my radius with the DRO, and resume cutting and do the other side. If you had some kind of a clamping mechanism that didn't require those external strap clamps, then you could do this entire part in one cut without having to change anything, but I didn't really have a way to do that. I suppose I could have put more holes in the wood or come up with some more clever clamping mechanism, but this worked, and as I said, it did get a little better at this as I go along. That's essentially the backer plate for the firebox done. Now at this point I took some measurements, and I noticed that the part was a little bit oversized despite cutting it accurately with the DRO. And I found this really consistently throughout all of these backers and formers that I'm making. The wood would spring back after machining just about exactly 10 thousandths. So if I machined a part to exactly 3 inches wide on the DRO, it would come out 3 inches and 10 thousandths wide. This was easy to fix, I just did some sanding with 80 grit to bring it down to final dimension, and I did start cutting the parts a little bit undersized as well, just to counteract that. I'm not sure why this was happening, I don't know if this is what wood does, if it was something to do with the humidity in my shop, or who knows, but it was an interesting kind of spring back effect that was very consistent. And finally I chewed up the bottom of the form. This isn't really essential because there's no flange on this side, but I did it anyway. And I could have done this on the rotary table if I'd had a better spacer set up besides the parallels that I was using there. That's the backer, and I can now make the former the same way, which I did, except that of course the former needs that one edge radius, just like the tube sheet. So I did some test cuts on a piece of scrap here for a bunch of different ways to do this, and what I found worked the best was a 3.30 seconds roundover bit. Even though the radius required is 1 16th, I found that a 3.30 seconds cutter gave me the perfect 1 16th radius. Again, probably because of that spring back effect from the wood, not sure. But I figured this would be a lot easier than sanding and filing all of these edges, which of course would also be an option. Quick aside, this oak actually makes really nice chips. After cutting the former the same way, I kept it in this same setup, and then I just ran that corner radiusing bit over all of the relevant edges of the part. And this worked out really well. If you don't have a cutter like this, I do recommend buying one for this because it was just the perfect tool. It worked extremely well, and I think it saved me a lot of effort. And as you'll see, it results in some really nice looking sheet metal parts in the end. The tube sheet was easy because it was round and I could just file it over on the lathe, but doing these corners for all of these other formers with these complex shapes was going to be a lot of extra work, and the radius wouldn't necessarily be very good. Then of course it's on to the copper, the same way you saw me do the tube sheet. In this case, I need two of them the same shape. There's a front and a back to the firebox. And once again, annealing and hammer forming, etc. So far, this is still very easy. This firebox is quite a simple shape still. Here you can see the importance of the radius on that former. It gives a nice curve to the corners where the sheet metal has to bend there. And that's important because this is a pressure vessel and you wouldn't want any sharp square corners because that's not going to be strong under pressure the way that a nice curve is like that. So it's worth spending the time to get that right. Next up is the back head, which is kind of like a partial circle with a square section underneath it. This is a fairly tricky one. 
Now, if you're wondering how I'm doing all of this layout, by the way, I'm using a stand here that I made for holding my chronometers and calipers. I set the desired dimension on my caliper, put it in the stand, and then I set my divider or my compass to the points there by eye and by feel. I found this method is accurate to within about four thousandths, something like that, pretty consistently if you're careful. Certainly for layout lines as we're doing here, where it's just a guideline and a sanity check, then it's more than sufficient. At this point, I figured out a much better way to get the form aligned with the rotary table. I aligned a parallel with my center line there on the rough cut form, and then I just pre-drilled and then put in some wood screws to hold the parallel in place. Now I can set this up on the rotary table, same as before, except now I've got a nice edge there that I can indicate in and get this form nicely aligned with the zero on my rotary table. I strongly recommend this method. This worked extremely well. It was very easy to tap this in. And again, as long as you're gonna be cutting all the sides of the part, this isn't actually that crucial. You can leave more scrap around your layout lines than I've done here and reduce the risk here of not having the part perfectly aligned. In hindsight, that probably would have been an easier way to do this. Because again, as long as the cutter is fully engaged all the way around and you're cutting all the sides of the part, then it doesn't really matter where you start because the final part will be correct as long as you're working to the right numbers on your rotary table and your DRO. I'm ready to cut that radius now, but this isn't a simple 180 degree arc like the firebox was. So for this, I needed to figure out exactly what angle at which to stop the cutter when it meets the square section. You can do a whole bunch of math to figure that out, or you can do what I did and just sketch it out in Fusion 360 or Tinkercad and just have the software tell you what that angle is to where the cutter needs to stop to meet that other edge. So I did that, and then I did a little test run here with a gauge pin standing in for the spinning cutter. And then I moved to the angle that I calculated in CAD to make sure that that seemed correct. And it did according to my layout, so I figured let's go ahead and cut it. Now, unlike the firebox, the straight section here is not tangent to the curve at the point where the curve ends. So I can't now just simply feed across and cut that edge in the same setup. I can still do it on the rotary table, but I have to stop there and do it in a second setup, which consists of setting the table at 90 degrees and cutting it to width. Okay, on to the throat plate now, which is by far the most complex and tricky part of the sheet metal work here. I've got two different formers that are required for this part, and I've got a fixture plate there that's gonna help. Let me explain what's going on here. There's a small former that's used to form the side shape of the throat, and then there's a larger one which forms the throat of the throat, if you will. And the trick with all of these sheet metal parts is you have to be able to recreate the same setup that you used to create the former later on when you need to machine the copper part to the final dimensions. And that's really where this fixture plate is going to come in, because unlike all the previous formers where there was an easy center pin reference, the reference for these curves is a virtual one in space that isn't going to exist when the part is done. So that's where this fixture plate comes in. I've marked all the critical dimensions on it, and I've laid out and created a series of alignment holes for the various formers so that I can get them all back in the same place when I need to come back later and machine the copper. I've made this fixture plate out of some high quality birch plywood because it's very flat, but it can still be considered sacrificial and I can cut into it without needing elaborate spacers and such underneath the part like I did for the previous setups. I start by aligning that fixture plate on the rotary table using that screwed on parallel trick. I'm very pleased with that. That's made this a lot easier. Then I'm going to tap in my alignment pins here, which I just made from some drill rod, and I set my first of the two formers on there. This is the larger throat former. You can see I've rough cut it on the bandsaw there already. So I can push that onto the alignment pins, and I know that the arc that I need to create there is correctly centered on the center of the fixture plate there. And then I would screw the form onto the fixture plate. So once again, I cut that and I put the radius on it using the same setup. You can see that went very well. And then the other critical dimension here is the height of the top edge of the arch here. And that I can easily again cut in this same setup with the rotary table set at zero and measuring the height on the DRO. Onto the smaller side former now. Once again, I can slide that on there, wood screw the former in place, and then cut the radius. This one has a slightly different radius than the other one did, but this is all again easy to do because of the fixture plate and just setting the radius of the cut with the Y axis. This former also has a critical dimension left to right, and I can again easily cut that here in the same setup just by side milling down to size, and then once again putting the correct corner radii on there. 
I think I made it look pretty easy here, but it took me quite a bit of figuring to land on making that fixture plate and doing all the correct prep work with all of the references and everything. I hope that made sense, and if you're doing this, definitely do something similar. The copper now, though, for the throat is pretty tricky. Kozo gives you this kind of diagram here for how to make it, but it's at a jaunty isometric angle, and I think there's a couple of dimensions missing that you really need to get that right. So you have to do a little bit of educated guessing for exactly how to create this intricate shape, but I did my best to interpret that, and this is what I came up with. So hopefully it's close enough to what's needed here to create this shape. Let's anneal it and put it in the hammer forms and see what happens. You start by forming the sides using the smaller side former there. And that was, of course, very easy. That's a straightforward hammer form. And now the tricky one is to put it in against the other larger throat former and form the throat. This required a lot of annealing because this is a very aggressive transformation that we're doing here on multiple axes. And this is the one place where Kozo gives you permission to use some metal hammers if you need to. So I did use a little bit of a cross peen hammer and a little bit of ball peen hammer as well, just to really dial in the curve there. This went really well though. It did take, again, quite a bit of annealing. I think I annealed eight times for this part, but I'm very pleased with that final result. Now we need to do some machining down a final dimension. This then gets screwed onto the side former and I can push that back onto my fixture plate and now I can do the final machining. The three holes there in the throat plate are holes that the final boiler does require. Those are stable holes, so you make those now so that you can use them to wood screw the copper piece down to the hammer form and thus set it up on the same fixture plate that we used for the hammer form to machine the copper. And if you do this right, then you should get a nice light cleanup cut all the way around there. You can see that I almost did. The edge of it there didn't quite clean up, and that's because I over tipped that edge a little bit. It's a little bit more than 90 degrees, but that's okay. I've got a really good surface there for silver soldering, and I don't want to try and fix that edge because I would make it worse and mess up the precisely machined dimension there. But overall, I'm really pleased with how that went. And then finally, I machined the sides of the throat to dimension. Kozo suggests sawing and filing this flat on the sides, but I figured I've got it in this setup here, so it's easy enough to just machine that until the side is parallel with the hammer formed side there. Then everything went in the pickle bath to get rid of all the annealing crud, make it all shiny once again. Well, at least make it clean anyway. Copper comes out pink from the pickling acid, but it'll turn back to a normal copper color over time. Well, there's all the parts we've got so far. That's the bulk of the hammer forming done and all of the forms and fixtures required to make it. That was quite a little bit of work, but it was a lot of fun. I've never really done any hammer forming before, and if you follow what Kozo says to do, it'll work for you just like it did for me. And that's all the time I have for the project this week. Thank you so much for watching, and thanks so much to my patrons who make all of this content and these projects possible. You guys are doing it all for everyone, and it means the world to all of us. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.